presence of God is so good in here this morning, huh? Y'all awake? Y'all excited to talk with your crews today? That is awesome. I'm so pumped. I'm so excited too. I just want to start off in thanks to Pastor Zach and Pastor Ashley and Miss Denise for allowing me this opportunity because it's a big thing to let somebody come and talk. Oh, my computer's awake. Um, come and talk to your people, especially with the kind of work that God's doing in your lives right now. It's like an honor to me to be able to do that. So thank you guys for the opportunity. Um, and also, God's kind of nice because yesterday was my birthday, so it's like a birthday present to me. <laughs> Yay! Aw, stop it. I'm just kidding. Okay, so a little bit about me. Who am I? You've probably seen me around um, here, or if you've seen any of the Rama um, Bible Training College, like Instagram stuff, I've been running around on there. So my name's Cassie. Um, I'm from Louisiana, and I feel like I have been kind of doing ministry stuff kind of my whole life. My mom was like a, a children's leader, so I helped with vacation Bible schools and stuff like that, and then did worship team, prayer team, youth leader team. Um, I was not... An athlete, I know you're shocked. Wow, that's shocking. No, um, I was in marching band. I played the flute and I also did, uh, yeah, I have some people in here. And I did concert band too, which actually marching band's a little athletic. But um, so I went to, then I went to college after high school. Didn't want to do that, but that's what God had me do. Um, and it was smart. He's smarter than us. You know, isn't that weird? Has any of you found that out yet, that God's smarter than us? Oh, excellent. That'll save you some time. Okay, so I uh, went to college, graduated with an English degree. Since then, I've been a teacher. I've done, like, managing at fast food and stuff like that. And now um, I work for some missionaries, and now I work at the school at Rainbow Bible Training College in the admissions wow. office. So, yeah, hack dog. Who's an alumni in here? Who's a student right now? Yeah, me too. Okay, so... In all of that, I got saved really young, like first grade. I actually have a picture from my first grade classroom that I saw, um, so I don't know if you guys have that. But um, yeah, look at that. That's my first grade teacher, Miss Leje. Isn't she precious? So in that classroom, um, just to the left of this, there's this little playhouse thing, and I was like playing around, whatever, as you do as you're when you're five or six, and I was like. I thought about salvation, and I was like, I should probably take care of that really quick. So I went under the little slide thing and uh, just prayed for salvation and got saved right there. So that's kind of funny. Um, but fast forward several years, when I was 18, I went to a, um, a youth camp. Um, youth camps are amazing. God really moves at those because we draw away and go listen to him. And that's when I got the revelation that God loves me. Not just, you know, it went from knowing all the right answers and knowing about God to actually knowing God and being like in relationship with him. And it changed the game. I was so hungry. I was so excited. I look back at my Facebook memories and they're all like, yay, God. Because <laughs> I was just so excited for what he was doing. Um, and funnily enough, that's the year that I also started on the worship teams. That's the year I first ever came to Oklahoma and was like, I want to be there for whatever reason. I wanted training really bad. And um, I wanted to go right out of high school when I was 18. And God was like, nope. And I was like, are you sure? Because it's like Bible college. I don't know if you know that. Um, yeah, he was sure. He knew better than me because there were some things that I had to learn. And some of that is what I'm going to tell you this morning. Okay, so this will help you with your long-term walk with God. So how many want to go long-term with God? How many want to avoid some frustration on their long-term walk with God? And how many want to progress as a Christian their whole life long? Oh, good. I'm in the right company. Okay. So let's pray really quick one more time just to get my nerves out, and then we're going to jump in. So, God, I just thank you for your word this morning. We just exalt you. We look to you. We thank you for your word, and we ask you to teach us and help us to walk in this word that you give us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So after Bliss this year, how many were really blessed at Blitz? How many like really encountered God and had like a change in their life at Blitz? I did too. It was awesome. So after that, I knew it was going to be like a time of teaching after that in here. And why is that? Well, I heard this quote once. And when I heard it, I was like, I'm going to throw my shoe. That's so good because it was so true. And I think we have it. It's <laughs> I'm serious. That's how I felt. Um, encounters without discipleship produces cycles. So I'll say that one more time. Encounters without discipleship produces cycles. And I was like, Oh my gosh, that's it. And what does that mean? So encounters, when you come into the presence of God and when you meet with God and the spirit of God is moving and he's doing things and he's making a change in your life, without discipleship, without teaching about the daily discipline of walking with God and the daily discipline of knowing him and spending time with him produces cycles. It will lead people to going back again and again to those experiences without living through their daily walk with God. So we don't want to do that and God doesn't want us to do that. 
So the title of this message today is Walk This Way or Walk by Faith. I couldn't pick. <laughs> anyway, Walk This Way or Walk by Faith. Um, when Sydney asked me about teaching Blitz, the first thing that came to my mind was an, a King James verse, which is really funny because I don't think I know King James. <laughs> um, but it was Ephesians 4, uh, 21 and 22. So Ephesians 4, 21 says, and I'm going to read it, King James. If so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, 22, that ye put off concerning the former conversation, the old man. And that phrase, the former conversation, is actually what popped in my head. Um, what does that mean? What is conversation like talking? No. So it's an old, uh, older word. We, we normally would use the word walk. Like, what do we do? We blank by faith. We Walk by faith. Okay, we blank in love. We walk in love. Okay, so why do we say that? Why does the Bible use the word walk? That sounds funny. Like, I'm walking in love. Like, I'm going to be so kind and polite as I walk today. No, it means something. It's actually kind of funny. I looked it up in the Old Testament, and the word walk means so many things that it's, like, silly. Um, <laughs> but it gets a point across. I'm going to read some of them because it makes me laugh. So, um, a walk. A primitive root, it means to walk in a great variety of applications, literally and figuratively. So it means to walk all along, a pace, how you behave yourself, to be conversant, so it includes the way you talk, to depart, to be eased, to enter, to exercise yourself, to follow, to go forth, forward. This one makes me laugh. To go about, abroad, along, away, forward, on, up, and down. <laughs> Are you getting the picture here? Um, it also means to be greater, to grow, to lead, um, to move yourself. And then later it even says pass away, like we die in faith, right? We're going to heaven. We're believing that as we die. Um, it also means to travel, to walk, and another. Abroad, on, to, and fro, up and down, to places, to wander. So it means everything that you do. And conversation's the same thing. It means everything you do, basically your life. And see, the reason that that's got so much to it is because ancient Hebrew only had like 8,000 words. We have like 170,000 now. So their words packed more of a punch and more ideas and more depth to it. So conversation and walk, it's the same thing. It's the way you live, right? Um, and Jesus, our life with him is a walk. He didn't say sprint by faith, right? He said walk by faith. Um, Ephesians 4.22, we're going to look at 22 through 24. He said, put off concerning the former conversation or the former way you lived your life, the old man, which is corrupt according to deceitful lusts. Your flesh wants stuff and it's, it's lying to you. Those things aren't actually good. It thinks it's good, but they're not good. So keep going. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. This thing is a process, y'all, your walk with God. And a walk is not a particularly fast way to get anywhere, right? And I think God was intentional with that. See, becoming a new person, when you get saved, your inside is renewed immediately. You're born again, right? You're born anew. All the old has passed away, the new is not. But on the outside, that takes some time. And I can prove it to you because think about the disciples. When they answered the call to follow Jesus, were they immediately 100% totally changed? No. They was cutting people's ears off and they was calling down thunder on cities or tried to and then uh, acting crazy, you know, um, trying to touch Jesus not to go to the cross. Not very Jesus-y. So, but what did Jesus do? He invited them to be his disciples and to walk with him. And as they did, his, their behavior would change. And then one step further, let's think about this. What about when the Holy Spirit fell at Pentecost, right? They get baptized in the Holy Spirit, the tongues and fire and stuff like that. The, the Spirit of God is moving and poured out so they could, they could go be witnesses. But were they perfect after that either? No, um, right? Not too far after that, there were some widows. Um, the church distributed stuff to widows because they were dependent on the church to survive. And some of the widows were actually being skipped and there was kind of a fuss over it. So they had to fix that. And then at one point, Peter, bless his heart, I love him because he helps me. Um, Peter was acting kind of funny around the Jews, kind of not really being himself, not really walking in all the truth that he knew. And Paul kind of had to call him out on that. So just because you're saved, which is awesome, and just because you're filled with the Holy Spirit, which is also awesome, doesn't mean your outside is all the way there yet. And the inner, uh, the inner man is renewed, and the outer man takes time, patience, and diligence. And there's a verse about this. It's uh, Philippians 2.12 in the CSB. I did my laptop because I have so many translations this time. I don't know why I did that, but I did, so here we are. Um, Philippians 2.12 says, Therefore, my dear friends, just as you have always obeyed, so now not only in my presence, but even more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and troubling, meaning like respecting what you're doing. For it is God who is working in you, 
both to will and to work according to his good purpose. So in this walk or in this life, you are working out by the grace of God, not in your own strength, not trying to produce fruit, but through the grace of God and the power of God and the leading of the spirit, working out that salvation into your behavior. And think about Ephesians, like putting off the old man. It kind of sounds like taking off funky old clothes and putting on new things, but even that is a process, taking off. If you try to do it all at the same time, you get tangled and that wouldn't be fun. So how do we do that? Um, Back to our... Key verse, Ephesians 4, 22 and 23, it says, putting off the former conversation, the old man, how? In verse 23, it tells us, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Your mind is being renewed to think and to walk and to act like Jesus. That will take all that behavior from the inside of you and put it into how you behave every day and put it how into how you treat other people and how you talk to your parents and how you do your homework and all those things. And we're thinking like the word thinks. So what does the word say about itself? Um, in Psalm 119, 105, again, the King James, uh, the word is a lamp into my feet and a light into my path. I want you to think about a lamp. Is a lamp a particularly huge amount of light? Yes or no? No. A lamp is small. Actually, in Bible times, there were these little bitty clay things that had like oil in them. They're just a personal light. And the word of God for you is a personal light around your path, not your five lane highway, but your path. <laughs> What's right in front of you for today, you know? So, They give enough light for today. And with Jesus and his disciples, with them living with him, he was the light, right? So he's, they're learning by walking with him, with that light that's just right beside them, how to go, how to walk, how to behave, not to call down thunder on people, but to be gracious and kind. Um, And this is how we were always meant to learn this, like day in and day out, walking together. In the Old Testament, um, when Jesus, when, well, Jesus, yes, all three of them together. But when God was um, teaching them how to walk and how to be with him. In Deuteronomy 6, it it said about your day, he says, uh, Deuteronomy 6, verse 7 says, you shall teach them the ways of God diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You will bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be frontlets over your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and uh, on your gates. So this is like always having it in your face, right? Always having it before you, because they didn't have the Spirit of God, but we do. We have the Spirit of God with us and the Word with us as our personal teacher, and Jesus with us always to tell us which way is right and what's, uh, what we're supposed to do. And remember that verse, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God or the sons of God, that's that, that's that relationship he's invited us into. And he's our guide. He even shows us stuff ahead. If we'll ask and listen, he'll even like shine a light like way far off, kind of to keep us on path. Like we may not know all of the steps to get there, but we'll be like, I'm going that way, so I can't go that way because I got to go that way. So it'll keep you going on your walk towards the future. And uh, this will help you when you feel frustrated because a walk is just day by day. So you don't have to feel like you have it perfect right now. You're learning that that inside nature is coming out. So will we sometimes maybe like stumble a little bit? Yeah, but the Holy Spirit will pick us back up and show us which way to go as we remain like humble and ask him, oh, I shouldn't have done that. Make it right and keep going, just keep your heart right. So that'll keep you from frustrated with yourself. But on this walk, this is another key area, we are meant to go together. Everybody in here is on a walk. Um, And this will save you some frustration because think about the Corinthian church. Okay, they had the spirit of God moving so much through people that Paul had to write them to tell them how to keep it in order because the the gifts of the spirit are there to edify the church and build people up. But if everybody's talking at once, you can't hear. You don't know what's going on. Nobody's getting built up. You're just like, God is moving. What's happening? So he had to tell them how to keep it in order so that they could bless the church and benefit. But same time, same church where God is moving, where the spirit of God is moving, there was some behavior in that church that Paul said even pagans didn't do. Yikes. Um, that's, that's pretty bad, Joe. Pagans. I was like, oh, Lord. And why is that? Because that whole church was saved out of people who previously were pagans. So they weren't Jewish before. So they didn't have that law that taught them how to walk in the ways of God. So they had to learn. So 1 Corinthians 13 was written to show them how to walk with God. That's why we have that chapter. And this will keep you with getting frustrated with other Christians. When I was younger and I, you know, I got excited and I knew about God and I'm going forward and I'm in church and we're having these, these uh, church services where the spirit of God is moving and I'm like, this is so awesome. And you're just trying to walk with God. And then somebody acts foolish and you're like, 
you get frustrated because you think they should know better, right? You're like, oh, we are in the same church services every day. We're in the same spirit, mirror, move of the spirit of God. God is doing this. God is doing that. We're in the same services, and they aren't acting any different. And I was like, this is all baloney. This is all baloney. I know God's not baloney, but the rest of this is just baloney. And like five minutes later, God was like, <clears throat> and I was like, <laughs> Yeah, because it's not just being in church services and being in the spirit of God that makes you act any different. It's applying the word to your life that makes you act different. And that's just true. That'll make you mature. That'll make you grow up. And I was like, thanks, God. So if you ever get frustrated with somebody and how they're behaving and how they're acting, remember, we're all on a walk. We're all getting revealed to the spirit, by the spirit of God of stuff that's, that's in us that needs to change. So instead of being frustrated with them, and sometimes we get frustrated with people doing the same stuff we do. So we can be humble and merciful and ask God to help them to see the light and pray for grace for them and be forgiving to them because they're just like us. We don't, just because we're farther in this area, they might be farther in this area and we need each other. So Let's take that frustration and turn it into humility and praying for each other. And so Jesus took his disciples. He's taking all these men with him and showing them how to behave. And what was his secret? I'll tell you. John 5, 19, I have it in the New Living. John 5, verse 19 says, Jesus explained, I tell you the truth. The son can do nothing by himself. He does only what, the father, what he sees the father doing. Whatever the father does, the son also does. We have the word and the Holy Spirit right with us to tell us what would God do in the situation right now, just like Jesus did. He would go off and pray and find out what God wanted. And I have kind of two stories from my personal life that will show you when God did this for me. So me, how many of you have siblings? Anybody? How many of you fight with those siblings? I won't look, just kidding. Um, <laughs> so siblings, because we're similar, because we act like each other, we know each other's buttons, and sometimes we push them on purpose. Sometimes there can be fighting at home, and that's not that fun. And I was so frustrated because me and my youngest sister are so similar. I love her, but we are like, ugh, copy and paste. And so um, she and I would fight all the time. I mean, and it wasn't good. Like, it was like, I, I hate this. I don't like it. And I'm a worship leader. So I can't be on this stage worshiping God at church and being like in charge of that and then going home and having these knockdown drag outs with my sister. So I was like, I'm done. I ain't doing this no more, God. We're done with it. What do we do? So I went to actually Ephesians 4, which is where our key verse is from. And, um, at the end of that, I got out my amplified classic large print that my parents gave me. Like if I wasn't going to be a teacher, I don't know what, y'all. But so I got that out and I defined every single word at the end because it says, put away from yourself anger and malice and wrath and bad temper and animosity. It says, put away, put off all that old stuff. And I sat there and got a dictionary and defined all of it out because I was like, what am I putting away? And the next verse tells me what I put on, which is kindness and tenderhearted mercy and humility towards others. And after that, I I'm not lying to you. I'm not exaggerating. I'm not telling a fish story where the fish was this big, but I say it's this big. Honestly, me and my sister have not had one single fight like that since that day because God, I was like, God, we have to do something different. And even like in the moment, so it wasn't, you know, and immediately everything's fine. I'm so mature. No, it's, I was growing. So like we're in the kitchen, something about the kitchen. I don't know what it is, but like fights be happening in there. And so you're like, you're in my way. I need that drawer. Um, so me and my sister were close to it. We were, I was like, God, what do I do? And he goes, shut up. And I was like, I, I captain. So I just didn't say anything else. And then like two minutes later, whole argument diffused. She apologized. I apologized. Done. Nothing happened. But because I was in that moment, what is the light for me right now? What do I need to do right this second? And I don't get offended if God tells me to shut up. That's how I talk. So he knows me. So if that would hurt your feelings, he would say, please be quiet. You know, <laughs> he'll talk to you as you need to hear it. But that helped me. And um, there's other places in the Bible where God talks about pace and where Jesus talks about pace. Um, he's, he said, we're the building. He's the master builder. Buildings don't just like building, you know, like it takes time. You're building it up. He's the vine. We're the branches. And that means we're totally dependent on him to help us produce this. Um, Jesus mentions walking in the fruits of righteousness. He likens the word like to seed and our hearts are soil. And and, and let me ask you something. If you plant a seed, right, you put it in the ground, like if I plant an acorn right here, right now, just do I go clear, clear, clear the area, oak tree, upcoming? No, that would be weird. Um, <laughs> because we know that's not how plants work. And don't you think God knows how plants work? It takes time, right? So I'm going to plant the seed and I'm going to let it grow and I'm going to let it develop. And some trees you actually have to like tie in a certain way so they like train to go up because they might do like this by themselves and that's not helpful for them growing. So do you think God did that on accident? No. God is so smart. This is wild to me. He created a whole world 
and created things in it that he could teach us about himself off of. That's next level smart to me. I don't know, guys. I, I can't, like my brain goes, like, <laughs> how you do that? It's so cool. Anyway, and then with it being fruit and with it being soil and with it being likened to stuff like that, us being a garden, our life is going to go in seasons. There's going to be really fruitful seasons where everything just looks awesome. And then there's going to be pruning seasons. Because of those fruitful seasons, there's going to be times where it's like, okay, you have that going. Now we need to cut back a little bit and work on some things and work on your roots and get some fertilizer in there so that you can go forward and do more things. So it's a good thing to be pruned because it just means you have fruit and God's like, grow, like training you so you can grow further. So don't get frustrated with your pace, right? Don't get frustrated with where you are because you are on a walk, you are on a journey. But if your walk with God has felt a little funny, just examine it. Um, can I have a person volunteer to play Jesus for me with me? Um, I have to pick a boy on account of the Lord. So uh, yes, right here, you can come up. <laughs> Sorry, it's just how I feel about it. Um, so it makes sense. You can come on up. So he's going to be Jesus. I'm going to be a very tall disciple. <laughs> Sorry. So um, we're going to walk together. So like if we're at Blitz and we're walking, you can make a lot of progress in a week, right? But just hold on right here, Jesus, because I actually want to go um, pay attention to some other stuff. And oh, but camp's coming up. Camp's coming up. Camp's coming up. Okay. Okay, God, let's keep walking in our direction. We're headed over there. This is awesome. I'm so excited. Oh, but wait, because... Uh, I really want to spend my time on these other things and like, oh, there's this new show that came out. So I want to binge it every day until I'm done. And then I'm going to talk about it. And then I might watch it again because it was that good. Oh, but oh man, oh gosh, summer plants is coming up. So, okay, God, we're going forward. So everybody give it up for our Jesus volunteer. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, if your walk feels like you make progress and then you go back and then you make progress and then you go back, when you pay attention to God like that for a whole week, you're going to make some progress. You're going to hear a lot of things because how much God talks to you in just that week because you've decided to pull away and pay attention. You don't have to have that just then. It's not only for just then and it's not only for those seasons and those times. It's for every single day, but it is that light for your path for today. What would you have me do today, right? Um, so that's that encounters without that discipleship producing cycles of walking back and forth and forward and back. You don't want to do that. And God doesn't want you to do that either. And he thinks that you're mature enough to take this information and to walk with it. And being intentional with your walk. Every day in the same direction, you will get a lot farther than just kind of being intentional sometimes. So there's a verse that I really liked that talks about um, what we're to do. Because basically... The thing that God kind of helped me with is we're not giving, we're not doing an obedient life right now. We're doing an obedient today. And today will take care of your life. You'll walk where he has you to go. You'll go in those paths. He'll give you the direction. He'll give you the light. If we're in that relationship today, your life is taken care of. Jesus said, you know, Matthew 6.33, don't worry about, or Matthew 6.30, don't worry about, whichever it is, don't worry about the future. The future has its own things. Today has enough for today. Be with him today. We don't have tomorrow anyway. And honestly, I can't get there if I don't walk every single step that it takes every day to get there. I can't teleport. That would be nice. And you see it. And that future is ahead of you. And it is ahead of you. But don't get frustrated when it takes the time that it takes to get there because God is working things in you, both for you and the people around you, right? So Romans 12, 1 and 2. I liked it in the Message Bible. Sometimes they just say things really nice in there. So the title of this whole section is Place Your Life Before God. And it says, so here's what I want you to do, God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life. You're sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, eh, walking, um, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing that you can do for him. Don't be so well-adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what God wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, uh, God brings out the best of you and develops well-formed maturity in you. See, because it's the Holy Spirit working in you by God's direction and through the power of the Holy Spirit. His yoke is easy and his burden is light. A yoke is what they would put on oxen back in the day when they were doing farming with oxen. They'd have them 
locked into this thing together so they could do work in the same direction, channeling that power and the stuff that's inside that oxen or those oxen to do stuff together. But see, when we're yoked with Jesus, he's carrying most of the weight and it's better to go with him in the direction that he's going. So just follow with him. You're yoked in with him. When he's carrying that and you're going with him, your yoke is easy and your burden is light. We're not doing this on our own. All of it, all of it, all of it comes out of a relationship with him. So in our daily time with him, through the word and prayer, and in those moments, check in with God. What do I do? And if he tells you to shut up, do it. It's going to help you, okay? Um, <laughs> and like we're falling so close to him that if he stops, we just bump into him like, oh, oh, why did we stop? What's going on? Um, there's a couple of verses about this too that um, I don't have the reference for. But they're just like, this is how it is. In him we live and we move and have our being. Um, he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. And as you live with him, there's a verse in Isaiah that says, you'll hear the Holy Spirit, this is the way, walk ye in it. You'll be looking left and right, and he'll tell you this is the way that you should go. Amen? All right. So we're going to um, pray really quick, and then I'm going to hand it over to Zach, okay? So thank you, Lord, for this word. Thank you for the Holy Spirit enlightening us today, and we ask you to help us to literally walk out, to take this into our everyday and go forward with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for watching. We hope that this message blessed you. Man, if it encouraged you, make sure you hit like and subscribe to our channel for future content. We'll see you next time.